Good afternoon, and welcome to all of you who are joining us live and also those who are watching the recording. Um, for our live audience joining us on Zoom, we will be monitoring the Q&A and answering some of your questions via text, and some of them will be saved for the end of the panel when we open the floor for audience submitted questions. Um, I am Dr. Shannon Kozlovich, she, her, hers, that is doctor as in scientist, and I am the projects director for the National LGBT Cancer Network. Our vision is a world where LGBTQI plus cancer survivors and those at risk are not only well-informed and supported, but also empowered to lead healthier, happier lives. We aspire to see a future where, where LGBTQI plus individuals are proactively educated about their unique cancer risks, enabling them to take charge of their health with confidence. A future where healthcare providers are fully embracing diversity and cultural competence, creating a um, healthcare system that's truly welcoming and inclusive. A future where the voices of LGBTQI plus cancer survivors are a driving force for change, leading to a more equitable and understanding world of cancer care and research. We're dedicated to improving LGBTQI plus individuals' lives by educating community, training healthcare providers, and advocating for the rights and well being of LGBTQI plus communities in mainstream cancer organizations, media, and research. We are pleased to present this webinar to highlight the launch of the um, 2024 Tips from Former Smokers campaign. In March of 2012, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or the CDC, uh, launched the first ever federally funded national tobacco education campaign, Tips from Former Smokers, also known as TIPS. The TIPS campaign features stories of more than 45 brave individuals from diverse backgrounds living with serious long-term health effects from smoking and secondhand smoke exposure. The campaign also features stories of family members impacted by their loved ones' smoking-related illnesses. Their message is, now is the time to quit smoking and free help is available. This year, the campaign has introduced several new people sharing their stories about how smoking impacted their lives and successfully quit. The ads illustrate the challenges that real people face every day because of smoking. Many of these new ads include messaging about the harms of menthol cigarettes and the tobacco industry's targeting of specific groups, which can contribute to tobacco-related disparities. Many of these people started smoking using menthol cigarettes, so that component is captured in their ads. CDC wants people to know that no matter who you are, where you live, quitting smoking is possible, and there are free resources to help. This year's TIPS campaign ads will run from February 5th through September 22nd on national cable and network television, digital video, display, search, and social media platforms. We are delighted to have Angie P. join us today to talk about her experience with the tobacco use and tobacco cessation. Angie bravely shares her story as part of the 2024 TIPS campaign and is here today to share her experience with us. Angie smoked menthol cigarettes because she thought it would help her cope with the fear that people around her would not accept that she's gay. She wants to encourage other LGBTQI plus people who smoke to get the help they need to quit. I will hand it over to Bry Bryce Kahari, the training and technical assistance manager here at the National LGBT Cancer Network who will be leading a discussion with Angie to learn more about how smoking impacted her life and her quit story. Thank you so much, Shannon. And hello, everyone. I hope everyone is doing well. And I want to thank you all once again so, so much for joining us. Um, I'm really, really excited to get into this discussion um, with, with Angie. Um, and Angie, I first want to start by just thanking you so much um, like Shannon said, for sharing your story and for being here. I think I speak for our entire staff when I say that we are so inspired by your quit story. And we're really excited for folks here today on the call to learn a bit more about you and your journey. Um, and so with that, if you're ready, we can go ahead and hop right in. Sure, let's start. Thank you. Awesome, awesome. So in your story, you talked about 
not being able to quit tobacco on your own, um, especially after hearing about uh, the a, a quit smoking program that is provided along with medication, um, you were able to quit. And so we know that some folks who use tobacco may be hesitant um, about taking medication or, or any other cessation therapy tool. And so I was wondering if you could just share more about your experience with the combination of using a tobacco cessation program with medication and how it aided you in being able to quit? Sure. One day I was, <clears throat> excuse me, sitting in a restaurant and overheard someone talking about a program to help uh, people quit using and uh, quit smoking medicine. I felt like when I heard this guy that I heard that for a reason, like it was for my ears only. And I thought I would try to quit. They prescribed me quit smoking medicine and, and counseling, and I followed the directions. After I picked the quit date for two weeks and started using the medicine, I was able to quit for good within a week, and it changed my life. It curbed my desire to smoke and addressed the withdrawal symptoms that you may normally experience when trying to quit, and I haven't smoked since. That is fantastic and so, so, so amazing. I I know that sometimes it just feels like you were just meant to be in a place, right? And I'm so glad that in that moment you were able to hear what you needed to be able to quit. Um, and I know also, you know, I'm really curious what you would say to any folks who may be a little bit hesitant, especially about, you know, looking and trying medication. I know several of my family members are always really nervous about it, but I just, if you could share any words to folks who are hesitant, what 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 would you say? I would tell them to research uh, the medications, you know, see what the side effects are. Um, I, I really didn't have any trouble. Uh, so yeah, I would research it. Absolutely, that's so, so, so important. And it's also really mm -hmm. important that we hear from incredible folks like you, your experience and how that along with, with you know, um, going through the tobacco cessation program was able to work for you. Um, and I know that you mm -hmm. actually quit smoking in your forties. Um, and before that you had smoked for over 25 years. And so I'm just really curious about what advice would you share for others, especially folks who are 40 and older, who may be a bit nervous about their ability to not just quit, but to quit for good? Yeah, you know what, Bryce, I would tell people that I know smoking is hard. I would tell people to talk to their doctor and to have a conversation about quit options. After smoking for decades, it's important to ask for help and support. You don't have to do it by yourself. However, your lives and your health are worth more. I want people to know that there are resources to help them quit for good. They can call 1-800-QUIT-NOW and visit cdc.gov slash tips, but they don't have to do it alone. I love that. I love that. And it's my favorite word, folks who know me know my favorite word is, is community, right? Um, we can't, mm -hmm. it is so difficult to be able to overcome, you know, t tobacco by just our, just our own devices, just, just ourselves, And that's why I love being able to have folks who are able to go through counseling. They're able to have programs. They're able to reach out and speak with their family members. Um, it really does sometimes take a village and a community, especially when we talk about the addictiveness of tobacco products. Um, and so yeah, I, I think really what, I think what you shared is so, so perfect. Um, I I also wanted to just highlight um, for some folks in the chat, I'm kind of, you know, monitoring our um, Q&A, of course, along the way, if there are any questions that you have in the chat, please feel free to throw those um, those questions in there. Um, we had a couple just like technical difficulties. And so that's why we're hearing Angie um, and Angie's voice and you're able to see Angie's beautiful, amazing picture on the slide. Um, and we're just, again, so, so glad to have Angie here. Um, Angie, I'm really curious, you know, we, we always, in the work that we do, we always want to center experiences and center advice from folks who've used tobacco. It, it's, 
folks who know what addiction look like, they sh and what a tobacco dependence look like should be the people who are leading our initiatives, um, you know, to help folks quit. And so I'm really curious, what, what is something that you want the tobacco control field as a whole to know about the process of quitting tobacco? Um, and how can we do better to support those wanting to quit? Well, first of all, let me say that smoking was ruining my life. I was sick and tired of being sick and tired. So I decided to reach out for help. The only way that I was going to be able to stop was with help because I had smoked too many years. I could not have done it by myself. I didn't know that there were resources such as quit smoking medicines and programs that could help me quit. I didn't know that they would be as effective as they were in helping me out. I want people to know that there are resources out there for people who want to quit and that they can ask for support that they need. I love that. I love that. And it's, I mean, it's so important that we, that we, first of all, really talk about what is available to folks, right? Because we know that LGBTQ plus folks, um, unfortunately, we know this based on data, are less likely to know about and use the quit line. And, and that's why it's really important that we start to center, you know, those 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 um, devices, those interventions that can help that doesn't include the quit line, right? There's several um, different texting portals and apps, um, several different other local programs um, that are really engaged in helping folks be able to quit. And it's really important that we know um, that I mean, it, like I said, it, it can sometimes take a village, right? And so I just mm -hmm. really, I know that that for me, my grandfather smoked um, his 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 entire life. And, 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 you know, ultimately what got him to quit was that he wanted to be there for his family, right? And he wanted to mm -hmm. be there for um, his grandkids and he wanted to see us grow up. And that's just why I was so inspired by your story, especially talking about identity and, you know, especially how, you know, once you quit tobacco, it wasn't just quitting this substance, right? But it was in finding yourself. Mm hmm I just, oh, I, I, I watched your story, Angie, and I just got chills, um, especially about mm -hmm. that part, because I think that as queer people, we're always taught to not bring our full self, right? And to not really mm -hmm. um, be able to be authentically us. And so I just love that in your story, you didn't just talk about um, being able to stop quit, quitting tobacco, but you also talked about how that journey led you to being yourself. Um, and loving yourself. Mm -hmm. And I just, I think that's so beautiful. Um, and so I want to move next into, um, you know, it's especially with, you know, in, in your story talking about, you know, um, kind of feeling different, right? And really being able to use um, cigarettes and, and tobacco products as a way to cope um, with a lot of those feelings that we talked about, right? Around identity, around hurt or anger, as it relates to your identity. We know right now that there are so many queer folks, um, especially queer youth, right? Who are who are really experiencing this right now. Um, just, mm -hmm. you know, with this feeling of just, you know, that they can't fully show up and be authentically them. And so I was just wondering like, how, how did you feel about, you know, smoking before you quit? And how did those feelings really motivate you to quit? Well, you know, I found myself smoking every time I felt hurt and angry, even smoking up to two packs a day as a teenager. And this continued for years and I struggled. It became difficult for me to focus at work, to catch my breath, and to go on about my daily routine. While I was smoking, I didn't deal with the complicated feelings that I was struggling with. I felt like smoking masked those diff difficult feelings. <clears throat> The secession program provided counseling that helped me quit smoking and process these challenging feelings. Now that I've quit, it's easier to do daily tasks and my life does not feel controlled by smoking. My quality of life has changed as I'm able to work out and lead a healthier lifestyle. Overall, I'm more mindful of my physical health. Absolutely. And what you just said there, 
about taking control of your life. That is exactly the message that we want folks to know, right? Is that, you know, quitting smoking is, is not, is, is not only are you doing this so that you can, you know, live a, a healthy, you know, amazing life, but you're also quitting because, you know, you're, you're able to take tobacco out of the driver's seat. Um, and that's mm -hmm. something that I think can be, it, it, I just, I, I can't even imagine how, you know, just amazing that you were able to feel being able to be in the driver's seat of, uh, uh, of, of your own life and to not let tobacco continue to take, you know, so many things from you. And I, I just think that that is so important and it's an important message that we need to be getting out to folks. Mm hmm so I know that you shared your, you know, within your recovery, within your recovery story and kind of your, your journey, you didn't just talk about tobacco, but you also talked about, you know, um, helping those struggling with substance use. Um, and I know that is something that, that we know there are so many folks who, who, who are dealing with, right? It's not just tobacco um, because we know at the root mm -hmm. of this is stress is trauma, right? And so I was just really curious, mm -hmm. how were you able to find the courage to be able to share your story? Um, especially, you know, so that Black, uh, that LGBTQ plus people can really know about uh, the tobacco companies marketing to our communities. You know, Bryce, I felt, I felt called to share my story to help others. I wanted people to know that smoking has affected my life even now and after quitting. I hope to help people, especially within the LGBTQ plus community, to quit smoking. There was a part of me that struggled with the fact that other people in my communities weren't aware of the targeting that we experienced from the tobacco industry. Mm. Yeah, I mean, and, and it's why it is so important for us to talk about that, right? And I loved in your story when when you talked about how 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 important it was for you to know that because it made you angry enough to quit, right? And I think it just continues on about this message of taking control of our lives, taking control of our identities as queer folks, as Black folks, right? And really reclaiming our spaces, right? We're not going to let these tobacco companies, their decades and centuries of marketing, we're not going to let them win. We're going to put our own self in the driver's seat and we're going to do it for ourselves, for our bodies, our mental health, our physical health for our communities. Um, and, and that is just, that it, it's so important that we talk about why, because I think sometimes when, when we, when we talk about different um, health disparities, especially as it relates to LGBTQ plus people, we, we kind of tend to notice that there's this label that's kind of put on us, right? There's this kind of notion that, you know, oh, well, we have these disparities because we live a reckless lifestyle or something like that. And it's not true, right? We need to be talking about, right, all of the root reasons as to why we're using these, these um, you know, substances to cope. And it's because of the stress. It is because of the trauma. It is because of going, you know, I feel like every day I'm seeing a new story of a queer person, you know, having to fight for their right to exist, for their right to live, mm -hmm. for their right to have their own culture. And it's really important that we call that out. And I'm so proud of you for being able to, to do that and empower so many other people to tell their story and to reclaim their lives. Thank you so much. Absolutely. And so you and I also have something in common. We're we're both preachers kids. Um, and so yeah. I'm really curious if you could share just a bit more about what it was like to grow up as a, a, a black preachers kid. I know I will be like over here saying yes to everything you say, um, you know, but not just a black preachers kid, but you also, you know, um, lesbian and how it, it impacted mm -hmm. your feelings around your own identity. I never quite felt like I belonged within my community, especially as a daughter of a preacher. I thought being gay would be difficult for my family to accept. 
I started smoking menthol cigarettes when I was 13 to feel more adult and mimic my mom, who I looked up to, who was a beautiful woman. Both of my parents smoked menthol cigarettes. I was surrounded by it at home and school. I kept smoking into my teens to deal with the feelings of fear that I did not belong because of my sexuality. My feelings about my sexuality were not something that I felt like I could share with my family or anyone for that matter. Yeah, and that's and it's so it it, it it's so so heavy when you're in an environment mm -hmm. where you don't feel that you can be yourself. Um and mm -hmm. it's just it's that weight, that heaviness. Um, it, it is something that I, I know a lot of us unfortunately have talked about. And I think that what you just said right here also really under underscores how important it is that we talk about what environments that we're in, right? Because we're not just wanting folks to quit, but we're, you know, mm -hmm. just, just for their health, right? We want them to do it for their community, right? For the people they live with, right? For all of the people yeah. that they interact with, right? Many, many of the people, you know, especially youth who are, who are looking up to amazing people like you and seeing your ability to quit, and it's really important that we as a community talk about how tobacco has infiltrated our community spaces. Because if you see it, if it's around you, right, you talked about both of your parents using tobacco, right? And so that was something you mm -hmm. saw, that was something you were surrounded by, right? I mean, I know mm -hmm. that I, I can't go to a queer bar or a queer club without seeing folks outside smoking. And so it's right. really important that we also talk about the ways in which that we're going to reimagine what it is like to be in queer spaces without tobacco. Mm-hmm. So, and I, something else that we have in, have, have in common and just, this just, I think I already was like a fan of you, but when I learned this, I just became even more a fan of you, um, is that we're both artists. And so, um, mm -hmm. you, I'm, I, I, I was a writer. I sure couldn't do like you and sing. You all do not want to hear me sing, uh, but you are a professional <laughs> singer. So I'm really curious to know like how tobacco use impacted your ability to sing and to express yourself. You know, I, I decided to quit smoking because it was uh, impacting my ability to sing. I've been singing since I was a little girl. I mean, I sang in gospel choirs, R&B groups, and even had a short time in Vegas. After years of smoking regularly, my singing voice suffered. I had trouble holding notes and keeping my, <clears throat> keeping my voice clear. My voice started to sound flat on certain notes. I knew that my voice was changing, but I didn't initially realize it was being affected by smoking. Smoking cigarettes impacted <clears throat> my ability to work as a singer, making it difficult to, consume, to continue pursuing my uh, my passion in life as a career. Singing was a gift <clears throat> and, and smoking took that away from me. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, I, yeah, it's, um, you know, it, just, just, just hearing you share that and hearing you share about how important it, it was for you, um, to sing, to be able as an artist to express yourself. Um, it, it really mm -hmm. just, I think, continues the theme of what we've been saying about taking control of your life and taking control mm -hmm. of your narrative. I mean, here was a way that you were able to express yourself. You were able to connect with other people, right, through your music. And, you know, I also am just like immediately after this webinar going to be looking you up to see if there are any videos of you singing. <laughs> Because I already know, especially if you grew up in church like like me and our preachers can, I know you can sing. I know I, I can't sing, mm -hmm. but I'm sure you can. Um, and so I'm so yeah. excited to go and check out, you know, your music. But I also am so grateful that you were able to, you know, recognize that this is something that is impacting my health. It's impacting my life. It is impacting my art and how I express myself. And so I'm going to do what I need to do to quit. Right. And I, I believe, you know, that there are so many amazing folks here who are watching 
who may be artists themselves, right? Or who may enjoy things like you said earlier, like like working out, being active, mm -hmm. you know, um, spending time with their families. All of these things are things that tobacco is trying to take away from us, right? It is, it is, mm -hmm. it is impacting our health. And so it's so important that we reclaim our lives um, and that we reclaim our spaces and kick tobacco out. Um, and so mm -hmm. I wanted to, um, you know, as we kind of close out, I really, I, you know, we know that tobacco companies really have, you know, target Black and LGBTQ plus communities with menthol ads. Um, a lot of our work at the National LGBT Cancer Network is actually in helping do what I was talking about earlier, helping our community reimagine what LGBTQ plus culture looks like without tobacco. And so I know that mm -hmm. you like 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 we were talking about earlier, you said in your video that knowing that, knowing about that made you angry enough to be able to quit. And so why do you feel mm -hmm. that it's important for black and LGBTQ plus communities to know about this targeted marketing, right? And how can um, you know, and about how menthol can make tobacco products more addictive? Sure. <clears throat> Growing up, there were cigarette ads all around. You couldn't walk into a store without seeing a cigarette display. Mm -hmm. It felt like everywhere I looked in my neighborhood, there were ads for menthol cigarettes. I saw it in magazines and commercials and my favorite shows on TV. Looking back, I can see that these advertisements were constantly present in my everyday life. It gave the false impression that if I didn't smoke, I wasn't cool. The advertising to the LGBTQ plus community is dangerous and targeted communities. There were a variety of cigarettes that people in the LGBT community smoked and they were all menthol. Mm. Yeah. It is it's it's shocking when we start to do the research and we start to see go back and, and really look at, you know, some of those those ads that were marketed right to black communities to lgbtq plus communities and starting to notice oh well wait this is for menthol and and that's for menthol and that's for menthol and and you know what we were talking about earlier it being surrounding us it, it being everywhere in our environment mm -hmm. when we go to the store when we go to the bar like it, the proximity of tobacco shops right it, you know, in our neighborhoods, right? That That is all something that was intentional. And it's really important mm -hmm. that we do like you have done in calling out the tobacco industry and also in holding mm -hmm. them accountable. It is so, so, mm -hmm. so important. And so I just really want to just yeah, it, it it is. And and it's something that we that we need to do more often. And I think that, you know, there are some folks who I I, I you know I talk to them and and they say that you know it, they are really they're not understanding why we need to focus on tobacco right now why tobacco is one of the health issues that we need to be addressing mm -hmm. and anytime somebody says that i i you know always say because it, it's continuing to take our lives and we're in this mm -hmm. work because we care about people and if we care about people we want them to live long, healthy lives that are free from, from tobacco. They can only do that, right, if they're not using um, this harmful substance. And so, Angie, mm -hmm. I just want to thank you so, so much for sharing your story, um, but not just for sharing your story, but also for encouraging other folks who are queer, who are Black, who are Black and queer, that they, number one, educating them, but also encouraging and motivating them to quit. I have, we've already heard from so many other, uh, other of our partners, how inspired they are by your videos and by you sharing your story. And so I just want to thank you so, so much for taking time to be with us here. You are more than welcome. Anything I can do to help, I'm happy to do.
Absolutely. Yes. Well, I, everybody needs to be, I know that we don't have the reaction and stuff, but please give like a roving round of applause to Angie. Um, I am so, 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 so excited um, that you have quit and that you're sharing your story for others. Um, and like I said, quitting smoking, one of the best decisions that you can make. Um, and so thank you so much, Angie, for reminding us of that. I'm now going to pass it over to Shannon, who's going to share a few thoughts before we move into our panel discussion. Shannon? Yes. Well, um, Angie, thank you so much for sharing your lived experience in such a public way by participating in uh, the CDC's tips from former smokers campaign. With all of the anti-transgender and anti LGBTQ plus policies sweeping our nation, queer visibility within this campaign could not have come at a better time. LGBTQI plus communities make up a significant amount of our population and our communities are more diverse than the general community. As Angie said, tobacco cessation is an act of self-love. Tobacco remains the leading cause of preventable premature death in adults worldwide. Within our own country, the commercial tobacco industry targeted our communities by coming into our hard-won LGBTQI plus spaces and publications to hook us on their products. Big Tobacco has targeted the LGBTQI plus communities and Black communities heavily with marketing for menthol and other flavored tobacco products. Um, products that the tobacco companies have known are more harmful for decades. Our communities use tobacco products at a higher rate than our straight and cisgender peers, particularly when it comes to menthol tobacco products. When menthol is added to tobacco products, they become easier to start and harder to quit. In 2011, the FDA's Tobacco Product Scientific Advisory Committee published a menthol report where their final conclusion was that menthol-flavored tobacco products pose a greater public health risk than non-menthol-flavored tobacco products. And within my own research, I found evidence that menthol may keep cancer-causing compounds from tobacco in your body longer, giving them more time to cause the DNA damage that leads to tobacco-related cancer. As the evidence has been piling up, numerous local jurisdictions and state governments have passed policies to remove menthol and other flavored tobacco products from retail stores. While at the same time, the FDA has been stalling on moving forward with a national menthol policy. Addressing clear and present public health issues can and should happen at all levels of government, federal, state, and local. With all of this in mind, I pass it back to Bryce to introduce our esteemed panel of experts and advocates to delve further into the discussion of the impact of tobacco, particularly menthol-flavored tobacco products, on LGBTQI plus communities. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Shannon. Very, very important that we um, really listen and take heed of that. Um, Shannon is also, in, in addition um, to um, being um, our project director here is also, um, uh, you know, like she was saying earlier, a scientist. Um, and so she's actually done this, like studied this. And it, I'm just so impressed and, and so appreciative that, that you're sharing that with us here, to, here today, Shannon. Um, and now we're going to move into panels. I'm so excited for these panels. We had such a great, you know, um, conversation and engagement with Angie. And now we're going to hear from some amazing panelists. Um, they're going to be sharing their personal and professional experiences with tobacco and cessation and how we can begin to overcome those barriers for queer folks. And like I said, reimagine a queer culture without tobacco and without menthol. And so after our panel discussion, we're gonna take some questions um, from our Q&A box. So feel free to continue to put your questions there and we will get to them if we have time. If not, we have amazing and incredible staff here that are going to be answering those in the chat. Um, and before we dive into this panel, we wanted um, to just take a few minutes so you can get to know them. Um, and so as I introduce each panelist, um, they'll be spotlighted here and they're welcome to come off mute and say hello. Um, um, and so we're going to first start with um, Dr. Arturo 
Durazo, who is the interim director um, at the University of California Merced's Nicotine and Cannabis Policy Center, and a community engaged scientist at the Health Science Sciences Research Institute. Welcome, Arturo. We're so glad to have you here. Thank you, Bryce. Thank you for the wonderful and generous uh, introduction. Uh, yeah, I'm actually a California native. I've moved throughout the state. I've lived in San Diego, Orange County, LA, the Bay Area, and home uh, since 2010 is here in the San Joaquin Valley. Uh, I've been in Merced um, with my wonderful partner, uh, Marcos. And uh, yeah, one of my, my biggest things that I'm a big advocate about because I myself am a cancer survivor uh, is uh, tobacco and cancer control. And uh, one of the things that gets me really jazzed about uh, tobacco control, that it's it's really a social justice issue. I, I really loved hearing your words, Angie, and your inspiration about how you got involved and your and your lived experience. And uh, it, it just really spoke to me. So, so thank you so much for including me in this panel. Uh, also, I, I, I have a, a big focus in LGBTQ plus communities. I'm the co-chair of the Out With Big Tobacco Central Valley. And recently I became a member of the advisory council to the legislative LGBTQ caucus here in California. So it's a That's thank amazing. you for the invitation. Absolutely. Well, we are so lucky to have you advocating for us. Um, and you're also a scientist as well. So any scientific questions, I'm just going to send them your way. <laughs> um, and so thank you so much. And now we're going to introduce our uh, next panelist. Um, I'm in Mississippi. And so this panelist happens to be my neighbor right in right in Louisiana. Um, and so Dr. Mirandi Lee is an MD, PhD student and Point Foundation Scholar at Louisiana State University Health Sciences Center in New Orleans um, for their School of Medicine and School of Public Health. Um, and Dr. Lee, we're so, so glad to have you here. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. Um, I'm born and raised in New Orleans in the Deep South, so my research focuses on queer uh, health disparities in the Deep South. Absolutely. Well, I'm, I'm literally like... I'm always in New Orleans, so we'll have to grab we'll have to grab coffee sometime. So impressed with your research and all of your work, and really glad to have you here with us. Thank you so much. Absolutely. So we're also excited to welcome um, our uh, next panelist. Um, this panelist, in addition to having an amazing name, um, has also been an LGBTQIA plus champion and community leader and is currently the director of public policy and programs for the National Black Justice Coalition. Um, it is Victoria Kirby York. Hey, Victoria, how are you? Hey, I'm great. Um, I'm so grateful for this space. Um, I'm honored to work at NBJCU where we champion the Black, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, intersex, plus and same gender loving community, including people living with HIV and AIDS. And, um, you know, this is an issue that is very important to our community. We are targeted by big tobacco on all sides. Um, and this particular issue is of importance because the down uh, factor uh, diseases and illnesses that come from smoking cigarettes and, and particularly the ultra addictive uh, menthol cigarettes um, lead to why our comorbidities are so high in various cancers um, and a whole host of other uh, diseases associated with its use. I know we'll talk about that um, a little bit more later. I'm thrilled to serve on the American Cancer um, Society's uh, National African American um, Stakeholders um, commission. I always forget the last word in the title. <laughs> I think it's like commission or committee, um, you know, where we have the opportunity to really help shape some of uh, the communications that they provide um, to our community. Um, and this uh, issue is what launched my can my career 26 years ago as a as a 12 year old um, fed up with having to deal with indoor smoking um, in Florida everywhere <laughs> and having to have my lungs and my health um, put at risk because of the adults around me. Um, and so from banning indoor smoking to pushing cigarettes um, from away from the candy and 
behind uh, the register, those were, this is the issue that politicized me, that got me involved in uh, organizing. And I'm glad to be able to be still doing this work so many years later. That's amazing. And it, I also started as a youth advocate in, in tobacco control. So it's nice to know I got a fellow youth advocate on the panel. And I'm also loving this artwork. Uh, just our, yes. our panelists are so phenomenal. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, we're going to introduce our, our um, last panelist um, rounding us out um, is the Director of Policy and Government Affairs at PFLAG National, Diego Miguel Sanchez. Diego, thank you so much for being here. What a pleasure and an honor to be with this team and on this a very important topic. My pronouns are he and L. My name is Diego Miguel Sanchez, and I am a former smoker. And I, I just need to say this. I was on the American Cancer Society's first LGBT advisory committee. It was in Massachusetts, and we had to push so hard just to get a brochure with images on it that with people who were queer, queer and visibly so, not imaginarily so. So it's it's been uh, quite exciting to be able to be here with you. So I'll stop there. Absolutely. And it's so good to see you again. I think we met a few months ago. Um, and so it's so good to see you again. I'm really excited for this incredible panel. Um, and so I'm not going to waste any more time. You already know that these people are phenomenal. And now we're going to dive in a little bit more. Before we do that, I just wanted to just take a minute or two and just go around for each panelist to just share about their area of expertise. Well, some of them have kind of already already uh, done this, but if, if they wanted to share any more words um, of expertise, expertise or experience with tobacco products, especially menthol products. We can start with Arturo. Hi, yeah, okay. uh, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to go into more detail. Uh, my work focuses on tobacco use and cessation, uh, given, you know, as I mentioned about my, you know, passion to think about how to bring down how cancer affects us, especially LGBTQ plus communities, we're very disproportionately affected uh, by cancers and a lot of them preventable. Uh, you know, we're not getting diagnosed early. Uh, we're not getting the, the support to be healthier, even when we're motivated to change our behavior. Uh, in addition to that, I also, uh, a lot of my, my training which happened at UCSF was also to work with tobacco users who are people of color and experiencing homelessness. So I do, a, I, I've been focusing a lot on the intersection of uh, being BIPOC, uh, experiencing homelessness and being LGBTQ plus. Uh, and, and that's a big reason why I've been uh, really working really hard to have my career my, and my research focus here in the San Joaquin Valley because despite that we're in the state of milk and honey, uh, we are in a region of four, over 4 million people where if we were carved out, have a, have a lot of parallels to other rural environments where there's a lot of bigotry, prejudice, and then we have the added element of, you know, uh, first generation Americans, like Latin, Latin A, Latinx people, uh, you know, being pretty much uh, also um, stigmatized for being, uh, immigrants. So, and the list Absolutely. goes on. But anyways, thank you for, for letting me share a little more about my background. Absolutely. Thank you. And now over to Victoria. I know you kind of already started with, with being a youth advocate. Really, you did the I whole know, I got so excited. <laughs> I, I know. love it. I got so excited. I, I, I would just add in, in terms of the personal piece, um, whew, the number of people in my um, family and in my life um, who live with the consequences of lung and throat cancer as a result of their um, cigarette use, who've had to go through chemotherapy um, and are still battling. Every time they think they got it, they're back at it with something else um, and having to get that cancer. Um, has impacted me beyond just the, in terms of the work that I do professionally. Um, Watching someone you love go from 200 plus pounds to 110 um, because they're fighting um, 
to fighting for their life every day. And it's been a constant journey for years of fighting for their life. Um, all because they were intentionally targeted, um, you know, by these, these tobacco companies, um, is, is painful beyond measure. Um, and there's a lot of self-blame that then people feel, guilt and shame that people feel about, well, if only I would have quit or I, I knew better. So this is my comeuppance from it. When they literally were targeted from God knows how young um, to the age they are now to be addicted and to and, and then ingredients are added to continue the addiction, right? Um, and so um, just wanted to add that personally, um, this issue is important because I want to prevent as many people as possible from having to live that experience or to watch and observe that experience as your as your loved ones cling to their lives and 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 some die. Absolutely, absolutely, and 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 can I also say that it is amazing and phenomenal people like you, Victoria, like all the folks on this panel, like Angie, right, who are telling the truth about this targeting, right? And are also raising awareness about ways in which you can quit. And I love, Victoria, what you just shared about that shame because that is so, so, so heavy. And I can't even imagine what that is for folks. Um, and I, I hope that as we continue to raise awareness that we can reduce the number of folks forever having to go through that. Um, and I'm gonna throw it over to Diego, I know you had already kind of talked about, um, of course, you know, being a cancer survivor, but if there were anything more that you wanted to share. Thank you. I'm actually not a cancer survivor. Uh, I am a former smoker. Former my, smoker. That's what my, my apologies. Both, Thank you. Both, no, that's good. Uh, both of my parents were smokers. Uh, both are were cancer su survivors. And my mother smoked menthols. My dad rotated between menthols and not. But I just wanted to say a couple of things, which is, first of all, I am so pleased not to be a smoker anymore. Um, I loved it when I was doing it. Let me just be real clear. It was so much fun until it wasn't. And I didn't have uh, cancer or actually any real um, visible impacts. But if I was still playing college tennis like I did at Georgia, I would have. It would have been uh, de minimis. But uh, but the thing for me is, from a business standpoint, like I was the uh, first, the uh, director of trans health and education program and the LGBT uh, health project at Justice Resource Institute of Massachusetts. Trans health was the first program in the country that that taught providers about transgender health care that was government funded. And so it was such an amazing thing. And I remember trying to quit back when I was on the ACS uh, committee, but you know, as an openly transgender Latino, I will tell you there was nothing that talked to me culturally. When I call the hotlines, when they first established those, they were not reaching me. They didn't know how to talk to me. And, mo and a lot of my friends are Afro Latino, so, or Afro Latina. And they just weren't, none of the materials were hitting us. The people on the phones weren't talking to us. And it made it very difficult to be vulnerable, which you have to be vulnerable in order to be open. So for me, I really take joy in things that used to annoy me that, that they're no more. For example, when I was in a meeting it had to be one hour and no more, or I was going to just pass out because I had to go smoke. Mm. What it meant is that if someone could hold me to a meeting for an hour and 15 minutes, they'd probably get what they want by the end of that meeting, just because I had to get out of there. You know what I'm saying? So those things are no longer factors for me. And and it's, it, you know, in, in, I grew up where everybody was smoking. Everybody around me was smoking. And Bryce, I had the joy of being in your hometown in New Orleans and watching people think that the action was outside. It was less than ever people, fewer people than ever outside smoking and all the action was inside. And I'm hoping that we can find a day when the clubs where you can get to hear the music all night long 
and not just part of the night because you had to go out and have a cigarette. Absolutely. Yes. And I also want to quickly just highlight something that you share is how important it is that we're tailoring our interventions, our offerings for the community, that those are tailored, right? Um, it is something that we have seen time and time again um, in our surveys and in research. It is so important for folks to be seen and to be represented um, and for other folks within their communities to be in their communities, right? You know that, you know that, you know, being someone who 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 um, is black who is queer I'm gonna best respond to black queer folks right um and so it's so important I love love what you shared there um and just to round us out with this question Dr. Lee anything else that you wanted to share I know you have such an impressive um you know background of research thank you so much um yeah I mean everything that I was going to touch on I think has already been covered. Um, my research um, focuses exactly on how minority specific stress affects LGBTQ smoking habits in the deep south um, where I'm from, um, as well as just like general stigma surrounding um, LGBTQ identity and prejudice events and things like that, how that all leads queer folks to smoke as a coping mechanism. And then one thing that I don't think other people have touched on very much is I also look at how um, queer folks smoke to socialize with other queer folks, which is a unique thing that um, we do. I know that I started smoking in my in my impulsive youth because I was coming to terms with my queer identity and I wanted to meet other queer folks. And it just so happened that in those circles, everyone was also smoking. Um, so I didn't smoke for very long, but I that that is how I started smoking about 10 years ago when I first came out as queer. Mm, absolutely a great point both like socially but also in the workplace too like the number of places not so much now but like when I first started like actually like doing the work and getting paid for it all of the people in leadership were smokers so if you wanted to have mm. that extra time to like build relationships and like try to like make sure you're seeing that folks know the work that you were doing you really needed to be in that smoke break corner, right? Mm. With those of us who didn't smoke and had allergies to smoke, which is my situation, right? You're left inside like, dang, what sausage making and happening is going on outside that I'm missing out on because I'm not a smoker. And so there were a number of folks, including some people in my staff, unfortunately, you know, who picked up smoking because they wanted to be in those conversations. They thought it would help advance their mm. careers. Um, so I'm glad to see that more of that is is fading and that is no longer like uh, the carrot that it was before. But what you said just made me think about it and how important it is that leadership from the tops of organizations show good health uh, patterns, especially when it has those kinds of um, impacts. I think it's Absolutely. leadership and also people with influence. I started smoking at the age of 30. And I'll tell you why. I worked for Holiday Inn Worldwide in Memphis. I'm from Georgia. And in Memphis, we were being purchased by some company. And we didn't know what it was, but all the IT people intercepted every email. So they knew everything. And they were just the, the working stiffs. But they had all the info. And you, in order to be with them, you had to be a smoker. They wouldn't allow non-smokers to stand with them, but they had all the info. And, th and that's how I learned that we were being purchased by the Bass Beer people, Bass BLC. But it was, it was that. It's either leaders, it's people with information that others don't have. Sometimes they're on top, sometimes they're not, but it's it was a, a bad way to have to do that. And then addiction takes over. So the celebration is being able to to find tools that are tailored for LGBTQ plus people, including including Latinos and including including API people and including Black people and Afro Latinos, which is is also very special. Absolutely, and you know what I think all of you really hit on that is so 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 important and it's necessary for us to talk about is that the tobacco industry knows this right that's why they're 
sponsoring our pride events. That's why they're, they're sponsoring our community events. That's why they're giving out and have in the past, giving out free cigarettes, right? Going in black communities with their vans, right? You know, um, they, they know this, right? And, and they're trying to infiltrate our spaces. Um, and so what all of you share was really, really spot on. Um, and I really want to talk, you know, specifically um, and kind of, you know, bring into this conversation conversation. Um, and I'm going to, you know, direct this to Dr. Arturo. Um, I know that especially with, and, um, and, you know, of course we've talked about this with Dr. Lee as well, but, you know, when, when we know that where you live can have a huge impact, right. On your health, on the types of tobacco products you use for your access, um, to different, you know, cessation products. And I know that your background has really been in also working with rural communities as well. And so I was just curious, um, we, I know we get a lot of requests and questions about, you know, doing work within, doing queer work within rural communities. And so if you could just share a little bit about what tobacco usage and barriers to cessation exist for rural LGBTQ plus folks. Yeah. Um... By the way, Vicky, what you what you said earlier, you made me, you reminded me that we need to think about this holistically. And in thinking about rural communities, and I'm trying not to just come up with like, you know, some outline bullet list, you know, I, I always challenge myself to think about it like this is, you know, these are very complex pressures. And and I think that many times we, even those of us in tobacco control work. Uh, we, we do a lot of like blame the victim, even inadvertently. So I'm really trying to do that. So let me start from the external stuff. Um, something that contributes a lot is that a lot of the rural areas are healthcare deserts. And what do I mean by that? Let me just give you an example. Here in Merced, for every, in Merced County, for every 100,000 people, there are 45 primary care physicians. When if you take the, the average nationally for every 100,000 people, you have 75, you know, 70, 75 uh, doctors. So for us in environments like the San Joaquin Valley, we're having 20 to 25 percent less doctors who can help us out. So already that we're, there's competing priorities. Uh, so I don't want to say Ooh, and, and I don't also want to say doctors are not doing their job. It's, they have a lot of work, <laughs> you know, they're, 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 they're carrying the load for, for a lot. Uh, and also that's going to also equate to, to limited access to support programs. Cause even in thinking about quitting, there's what we've talked about advice, giving advice, which it's very effective when MDs do it and also other practitioners. And then there's also getting the support. Uh, you, we cannot have effective, successful cessation programs if we don't think of this as like a full, you know, trajectory. Uh, in there is, and what happens also in rural areas, it's going to be really difficult to find affirming care for us. Uh, the programs that do exist uh, are, are very limited in just even being able to ask, you know, the basic questions that make LGBTQ plus people feel comfortable in getting care. Mm -hmm. uh, another element is that there's a lot of, you know, uh, there's a lot of, uh, how do you, I don't, it's, you know, I don't even know what to call it. It reminds me of like libertarians uh, or laissez faire. It culturally embedded in rural areas, there's this like, it's my life, it's my choice. You're not going to tell me what to do. So re tobacco retail licensing has a whole other dynamic in itself. So a lot of times there's this, this, this perception that even here in California, like, well, there's all these great, you know, bands and rules in California. Guess what? They don't trickle down to the San Joaquin Valley. Uh, actually, in, in doing a lot of the, you know, the research we do, we're learning that city councils, board of supervisors, they're, they're not even looking if, you know, how many retail licenses for tobacco they're giving that are within a thousand feet of schools. Uh, you know, like forget 500, I, I mean, even 500, you know, 500 would be an advancement. It's like, there is no, there is no consideration of that. 
Uh, and then a lot of the other ones that have already brought up been brought up, I don't want to repeat them. So um, I'll let somebody mm -hmm. else take from there. But I, I wanted to at least start from here are the structural barriers mm -hmm. that make it incredibly difficult and, and promote and inadvertently promote. And also, I do want to reinforce that in all the work we're doing, eight out of 10 people who are lifetime smokers, who are LGBTQ+, and are people of color, are motivated to quit smoking. I just, mm. want, to, I just want to reinforce that. Yes, I'm, I'm so glad you said that because that it, it's it's so important for us because we know that there are so many folks, right, who want to quit, right? And so it's, you know, the onus becomes on us as folks working within public health, working in healthcare to be able to tailor the interventions. We need to be making sure that we are, you know, looking at the different interventions and tailoring them to the communities who need them. And what we have to do is something that we were talking about earlier with Angie. We have to listen to folks who are using tobacco. I know a lot of times in some spaces, it feels like, oh, we're only listening to this person who has all this experience. And, you know, I'll be the first to say, I've never smoked a tobacco product in my life, right? And so I am very limited in what I know Folks who have used these products, like some of you all, know what the true cost of addiction or a tobacco dependence look like. Um, and so I want to close out this question by um, just going over to Dr. Lee. And I know that, you know, like we we're talking about earlier, a lot of your research, you know, that you've done, especially with, you know, tobacco use disparities and cessation within LGBTQ plus communities in the Deep South. Um, and so I was just wondering if you could share a bit more about what some of those barriers to cessation look like? Yeah, absolutely. I think that cultural tailoring um, to the LGBTQ population is really critical um, for tobacco cessation because there are so many spe LGBTQ specific or unique factors that um, cause us to smoke or prevent us from quitting smoking. Um, I really love how Angie talked about how on her quitting journey, she um, healed from not only the smoking aspect, but also from all the trauma she's faced, like as a queer woman. Um, and I wish that happened at every single smoking cessation, um, you know, therapy, group therapy or individual therapy. I wish we talked about minority stress. I wish we talked about how it's not your fault and the big tobacco companies are targeting you um, to shorten your lifespan. Um, and I wish, you know, there's so many things like the socialization aspect, um, in like a regular smoking cessation program, they might pair someone with a buddy to help them quit smoking. But if queer folks are smoking to socialize with each other, pairing them together might potentially, you know, not work and they might smoke more to socialize mm. with each other. Um, so these are just speci LGBTQ specific things that um, need to be addressed. And I do wish that we had more culturally tailored programs for sure. Mm. That and 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 that is so important. I think oftentimes we don't even think about that, right? Like we don't even think about that, especially when you talk about what Victoria and so many other folks were sharing earlier about that socialization piece. Um, and so it's very important for us to consider. Um, I want to also just take a step back um, because you know we've been talking about tobacco, um, but I, I know it's certainly what has been top of mind for me um, and what I think has been top of mind for so many people um, on this panel um, is just the record number of anti-LGBTQ plus legislation, the rampant attacks that we've seen on our community, especially trans and gender non-conforming folks, especially trans and gender non-conforming youth, um, I, I know for, for, for so many of us on the panel, that's top of mind. We're really seeing, you know, we already had three record breaking years when it comes to this anti, um, you know, trans and gender nonconforming legislation. And now this is set up to be yet another fourth record breaking year. We're exhausted. Um, and so I really want to just, and, and I'll, and I'll direct this over to Victoria first and then, um, to, Diego to um to really just talk about that that stress and you know and how that you know the um stress and the trauma and the impact of these attacks how that's had on queer folks especially trans and gender nonconforming communities. 
if you don't mind, I'm gonna kick it to my friend Diego first, just because the the topic I think is um I, I certainly don't mind responding afterwards, but um as a trans man, like I just feel like he should kick Absolutely. Kick. She's my baby sister. Um <laughs> I was like, me, me, teacher, call on me. Um, <laughs> I will say that we are on, on our way to another record-breaking year. We already have 450 anti-LGBT plus bills, anti-LGBTQIA plus bills. And, and I want to answer this with a question that I saw fly by in the questions that I, I'm sure it's already answered. So sorry for the dupe. But I'll say the question was about uh, how can thing? How can hotlines and quit lines be more culturally adept? How you know? I was talking about how they didn't speak to me, and what kind of things can people do? If you have waiting music, and you know you have a large Black or Latino or Afro Latino audience community, play some music we want to hear. You know, uh, make sure that people it, have language co competency, even if it's Spanglish. You know, some people speak Spanglish, have that, treat it like a language, treat the people like people you would want to meet. And so what we're seeing in our community is an awful lot of all kinds of bills, everything from even everything from, you know, don't say gay, don't say trans, don't say black in a classroom. One of the things quit lines can do is make sure that they're asking for people's name and not and not call it preferred name, it's their name, mm. and ask for pronouns so that they can be referred to in a way that feels respectful. Asking that opens up someone to being able to feel included and involved and heard and seen. And those are the remedies to responding to the anti the anti LGBTQ plus legislation is showing that someone cares. Imagine if the quit line could be a place where someone actually feels more embraced than they do in their classroom. We have the power to make that happen. And so I think that there's a there are solutions out there. The good thing I work at PFLAG, so it's all about family support. And some families actually have to be taught how to, you know, everybody loves their kids. Some people have to learn better how to do that. And so how to make it so that it's feelable by their children. That's part of where mm -hmm. people like comes in. But the legislatures, you know, I work, I work with legislators all day long. And what I try to tell people is, you know, they sometimes they, that they talk to their legislator and they say, you know, I got the door slammed on me. I got thrown out of my legislator's office after I told them my story. And what I tell people, and I want to say here, is that people are only human, which means even if they don't tell you that they heard your story, when you tell them, their head is going to hit the pillow every night. And one of those nights, your story is going to seep through and they're going to it's going to make them feel even if it's just a little bit bad. They're going to they you know, they they probably know their maker and they know they're going to have to answer for it in some way someday. So I want people to feel, first of all, safe when they're out. And if it's not safe, don't come out. Don't be out. Stay safe. But you can go on a quit line and say your name and ask for your proper pronoun. So to me, those are the things that we can do. And I'll pass it to my sister. Thanks, big bro. Um, I would just add that um, when you're looking at the context, the landscape that we're in right now, there's a lot of uncertainty for members of our community. Uncertainty at work because there's efforts to remove diversity, equity, inclusion, policies and programs out of the workforce, things that otherwise would mandate a lot of what um, Diego was just sharing. Same thing is happening in school districts around the country, right? Um, and while shopping, right? There's always the fear that someone who's not been equipped well, um, whether it's a retail or public service uh, venue, um, is, is um, going to cause harm you know, whether it's physical or psychological um, to you. 
that level of uncertainty regarding whether you're treated with respect, dignity, fair treatment, um, having the, the ability to have opportunities presented to you or not. Um, as we talk about, when we talk about whether someone is told about the screenings they need, healthcare screenings they need, why some folks get told that they should have certain screenings at 40 or 50 and what some people find out when they're 70. Man, I was supposed to do what? When? None of my doctors said that over the last 20, 30 years, <laughs> right? Um, and so that level of uncertainty about how you're going to be treated on the micro level causes anxiety. It causes mm. stress. And that's even before something actually does happen to you, which then causes trauma and potentially long lasting physical and mental harm, right? And I say all that because it goes into why menthol in particular, but it's it's homie nicotine, uh, why they're so dangerous. When you're dealing with these kinds of realities, you're more likely to suffer from depression a form mm. of depression. And when you live with depression, as someone who's lived with depression since I was a child, it often means that you have a low number of certain neurotransmitters, whether it's serotonin or dopamine. I'm gonna land on dopamine because the reason why nicotine is so effective is that it temporarily increases the dopamine in your body. So if you are depressed or feel stressed by all of these things that have happened to you in your life or that you are fearful of is going to happen because of all of this legislation, um, taking that puff of a cigarette, particularly a menthol cigarette, because menthol increases and multiplies the um, effects of nicotine. So if it was slightly addictive here, a little, no, I shouldn't say slightly. It was like midline addictive here. Like, yeah, add that menthol in. They work together synergistically to be like, bam, baby, we got you, right? And so if you come from a community, whether you're Black, because we also deal with it, and if you're at that intersection, you're getting it on all sides. Add on all of the other racialized communities and, and other minority statuses, Um the, the, the industry is targeting you on purpose. They know that you might be depressed. They know that your dopamine levels could use that temporary increase. But just like cocaine, the hits further on ain't never as good as those initial hits. So after a certain point, that nicotine isn't given what it was given before. And on top of that, your body can no longer actually create the dopamine naturally. And so you're addicted and stuck and the product is no longer doing what you initially thought it was going to do, which is why nicotine patches and Nicorette gum, those kinds of things can sometimes be really helpful for folks who are trying to quit. And also you can get rid of your cigarette. And if you want some of the other benefits that menthol itself can bring, you can separate the menthol from the cigarette. Stop smoking. And there's a lot of other forms of menthol because that's for part of peppermint, right? It's part of the mint plant <laughs> that you can get to get some of the other benefits that folks, for other reasons, why folks will smoke those kinds of cigarettes. But anyway, I'll get off my soapbox, soapbox on that. But all that to say is they're targeting us because we're being targeted. Mm. Yeah, I can I I just want like we're gonna have to use that clip of you <laughs> walking through it and you're like bam like that was exactly it that's exactly it and it's not this is not by accident it's very very intentional um, and I wanted to um, ask just this last question as we kind of move toward the end we're gonna take a few questions from um, our um, Q and A box um, I know we kind of we kind of we kind of already started uh, but before we do that I really just wanted to ask um, this last question. And I wanted to start with Dr. Lee, um, it, especially as we start to see in many places uh, they take action around menthol. Um, how might this affect Black and LGBTQ plus communities? Um, and what does this world um, without menthol on, on the shelves look like for these communities? Yeah, absolutely. Um, a world without menthol, especially, and even a world without targeted, you know, LGBTQ advertising or advertising towards other um, underrepresented groups like Black and Asian and Indigenous and Latinx folks, 
a world without all of that looks like a healthier world for our communities. Um, it looks like a happier, um, healthier, longer living, easier breathing world um, for us. Um, so really addressing um, the use of menthols as well as these targeted ads. Um, you know, there are some folks from the LGBTQ community who, uh, because these ads started in the 90s when there was a lot of LGBTQ, or not LGBT, a lot of tobacco regulations going on, regulating where they could advertise and how they could advertise, tobacco companies were losing money. So they were thinking, you know, how can we make more money? And that's when the targeting started. And so these tobacco companies were seen as kind of like revolutionary for supporting the LGBTQ community back in the 90s when not many big companies did. And so that mm -hmm. resulted in a lot of queer folks believing that, oh, tobacco is not that bad for us. Actually, they're helping us. And so even though that mindset has been hopefully broken down by now, there's still folks in the community who are like, oh, I see this, you know, this tobacco company at a pride festival. They're supporting us. They're good. You know, they're the good guys. Um, so addressing that is definitely really important um, to improve the health of our communities for sure. Yes, absolutely. And it's so important to, to explore that history and to know that, right? Because, you know, ev everybody who it shows up for you it doesn't really care about you. Everybody who gives you a donation, it doesn't mean that they care about you or even your cause or even your plight, um, especially because the tobacco industry cares about its bottom line. They see people as profit. That is all they care about. And it's important, like you said, Dr. Lee, for us to talk about that. Um, same question um, going over to Arturo, um, really just asking what we're, we have, we, we're reimagining, we're, 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 we're re-envisioning what a world without menthol on shelves look like for our communities. Well, this, that's a fantastic question. Uh, and a lot of this has been touched upon already is menthol, we need to have those conversations that menthol makes it easy for young people to initiate. So we already have these, and I, I loved all the examples that are, have occurred, like yes, 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 about when we're at the clubs, we're at the bars, the smoking is part, it's first, it's normalized, uh, and in some, in, in some environments even promoted. Uh, it's part of an image, it's part of, you know, it's a, it's a positive, let me just say it, it's a positive thing. You know, if you feel isolated and you're gonna be part of the cool kids, and feel like you're part of a, of a society, that's a plus, especially when we are feeling isolated. Uh, so, so I think that we need to have these very candid discussions that menthol is mm. tied to initiation. And at the same time, we need to talk about that we, are, and Dr. Lee, you've already uh, touched on this, is that we need also have very candid conversations that this is the tobacco industry making us and keeping us sick. Uh, because if you also, and we also need to pay attention, but especially those of us that are from communities of color, um, you know, what we're also worried about is enforcement. What does that look like? Uh, is this just going to be another layer of criminalizing people of color? Um, and so there's a lot of very, very significant concerns that the tobacco industry is totally uh, co-opting and exploiting. Uh, to really to to slow this down, uh, I'd like to promote that we need to be a little bit. I don't. I personally don't perceive that we as an LGBTQ plus communities and advocates have been so linked into the FDA ban. Uh, and in, in fact, we're twenty twenty four. Where is this ban that was proposed in twenty twenty one? All the recent press has been about. Oh well, the you know the the tobacco industries are getting ready to like do these counter suits and stop this. Uh, so there's this a, a huge opportunity for us to mobilize with our intersections and diversity and hold the the, the government accountable that this is part of keeping our communities healthy and also to push back to the tobacco industries that they are they've been exploiting and making us sick for decades. Now. Anyways, I'll stop. Absolutely. Absolutely. No, that was so perfect. Um, and now I just want to take a couple of questions from the chat um, and I'll kind of just 
direct those those at folks. Thank you all also in the comments for being so um, supportive of our amazing panelists and Angie earlier, as well as asking questions. Um, I know that we were talking about ways that cessation can be included within LGBTQ plus community service and community organizations. Um, and so I wanted to um, direct that question toward um, Diego. So what are some ways that we can start to look at cessation and make sure that it is included in other LGBTQ plus community service and community organizations? So I'm so glad you asked that, Bryce. It's a great question. I mean, my background is corporate, nonprofit, and government. So I will say that one of the things that we can do that it can look like blends all three of those in a way that says that if we're gonna be passionately immersed in finding emulative joy, that the that the copycatting should look like people who proudly say they no longer use menthol cigarettes. You know, we talk about role models for absolutely everything. We've used them for everything from, from getting HIV tested to condom use to, to which brand of watch to wear. We, we have done it in absolutely every area. And we should realize that, the, you know, I, I spent most of my adult life in Massachusetts. So we were the state that sued in order to get the money in order to do cessation programs. It's why we have so many there. Uh, so the thing to do, I think, is to blend the units. At least we look at corporations to support nonprofits and organizations why not find some that will uplift us lifting up, working with, of course, the National LGBT Cancer Network to start identifying role models who are willing to talk about how they were stronger and not weaker from that. You know, I, I always, when people talk about shop therapy, I've always said, you know, I, I understand shop therapy. Every time I go in a shop, Everyone make sure that I'm never lonely because there's always a security person walking with me. Those things are things that we can make a part of our history instead of part of our present. Yes. Oh, the way that you ended that too. I, I love that. Thank you so much for that. And, and I also want to, um, you know, direct this question as well um, to Victoria to um especially you know as in your earlier conversations you were you already kind of started hitting on this but really you know what are some ways that cessation can be included in LGBTQ plus community services and community orgs so I think there are a couple things um well my brain also still stuck on with Diego mentioned corporate I was thinking well it's a, it's a, it's good for every job's bottom line to not have their employees get sick and then become disabled uh, because of tobacco, um, and even more so because of menthol. Um, anyway, to the question, my brain is just stuck there now. I'm like, ooh, what are they? But in terms of nonprofit organizations, I'm going to go back to ways to boost dopamine naturally, right? There are things that community centers already do that can be messaged as, as cessation programs that's backed up by research, for instance. Listening to music helps to boost dopamine, especially for communities of color. And we're also learning country folk too, you know, country music too. We love to listen to music. Come on now. Yes. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, you know, you can have dance and music focused events that also help to naturally increase dopamine. Put that sick, put that Newport away, put the cigarette away, not to call out a particular brand, but um, I don't know. And my family, like, Newports became kind of like how Google is for search engines, like all cigarettes were Newports. And so that's why when I think about menthol, I'm like, shoot, I think I thought all cigarettes were menthol coming up because everybody had a Newport. But anyway, back to the examples, getting enough sunlight, activities that nonprofits can do that have activities outdoors. You know, there are different um, LGBTQ plus and same gender loving football teams, soccer teams baseball teams, um, there's the gay games that's coming to the United States soon. Like getting enough sunlight is another way to naturally increase um, dopamine uh, and including exercise as well. Um, and then, you know, food events where there's food, being able to highlight, okay, this, this meal 
happens to have these ingredients. Maybe have a cessation forward happy hour where everybody's bringing in their favorite turmeric, like infused foods, their favorite fish, um, you know, their favorite, you know, I don't cook. So I struggle with coming up with examples of food. That's my what my wife does that. Thank God. Uh, <laughs> nobody wants to eat my food. Not even my six-year-old. <laughs> But, but everybody know. wants to celebrate taste buds. Yes. <laughs> so yes, back on topic. But you know, having you know these kinds of um, uh, meet and greet activities that are done through the theme of cessation and highlighting dopamine friendly um, foods can allow people to start thinking about cessation um, differently. As opposed, as it's like, okay, what am I replacing this cigarette with? A much healthier lifestyle all around and you can do them yes. in community, which always helps when you're doing something in community always nonprofits that embrace our community i love that absolutely well i want to give um just 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 the the last minute of our panel to dr lee and and arturo um if you have any other final thoughts about that question or about anything else if you just had some quick final parting words for us I'll turn it to, um, well, Arturo first, and then we'll end with Dr. Lee. Uh, I just want to bridge what you just said, Victoria. Um, disproportionately, you know, we as LGBTQ plus communities do deal with disproportionate rates of serious psychological distress that, you know, um, we have higher rates for suicide as teens. Uh, we become, you know, are being able to be functional and having a, a life that's free of, of being depressed or anxious uh, can be really, really difficult. Uh, having said that, yeah, like I, I was, I've been reflecting, like we have not been promoting um, trans queer joy. Like we, 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 we're at a point where we're, and maybe it's because we're just so focused on, and for obvious and great reasons, like, uh, uh, like, just the recent attack on Max Benedict, you know, it's so easy to get stuck on that. And we're not balancing that out with queer, trans joy, mm. gay joy, lesbian joy, bisexual joy, all of your joys uh, yes. in, a, in a way, uh, because one of the things that we do know about smoking cessation, it's incredibly interlinked with having positive social support that's helpful. Yes. So, so it, it's not just about the individual, it's about creating a village where we are supportive, where we celebrate each other in very constructive, positive ways. Yes, I love that. I love that so much. And over to Dr. Lee for the final word. Well, I'm going to steal my final words from you. I remember in some other webinar that you did, Bryce, um, you phrased it as quitting is an act of self-love. And I have been telling that to everybody ever since I heard those words. And I really love um, how quitting is an act of self-love and an act of improving not just your own health, but your health of your community as well. And so I think one of the best ways that we can care for our community is helping members of our community who smoke quit um, and also preventing folks from smoking as well. So those mm. would be my final words. Which Absolutely. are your words, Bryce? Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Lee. And all of our panelists, I, I am all, I all want to like just like have a meal with you all and share space again soon. I'm fascinated by all of you. Thank you all so, so much for sharing your perspectives, experiences. It, I'm a huge fan. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Shannon to close this out. Yes. Well, just a huge thank you to all of our panelists. I mean, you are all out there being the real life superheroes with the work that you do. Thank you so much for sharing space with us today, for contributing everything that you contributed for every single one of your answers and your expertise. You are so, so appreciated. In addition, none of this work could be, none of the work of the LGBT, um, the National LGBT Cancer Network would be possible without our amazing staff. And thank you to our audience who were here live and everyone watching the recording. Thank you so much for the contributions that you made and for spending your time with us today. Your engagement is appreciated. So please follow us on all of your preferred social media channels and stay tuned for our upcoming events.
with that, I will go ahead and close us out with just another huge and amazing thank you to everyone.